right, so joining us now in the studio is Liz Vole. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to be here. It's over a year. What is it like watching this video for you now? Huh, um, <laughs> I try not to watch it because it brings back memories of, of that chaotic time. But um, I don't have any regrets watching it all this time, especially uh, having witnessed or, you know, having seen the way things have played out on the ground in Ukraine. I can, I think we can all pretty much confidently say that Russian media has indeed been instrumental in manipulating the information space when it comes to Ukraine. So um, I'm glad that I took action at the time that I did and hopefully brought attention to the issue um, in one form or another and, and get people kind of interested and uh, I guess aware of the role that Russia plays in today's news and geopolitical Well, and you've climate. had an interesting arc, because, I mean, in your statement with what you were saying, it had personal elements with your Hungarian heritage and yes. discussing that. But since then, I mean, you've gone on to become, uh, you know, an expert, someone who speaks more generally about what this new style of Russian propaganda is and speaking in front of Congress. Um, but, I mean, I was curious, since we're dealing with this one-year anniversary of the shooting down of MH17, mm. I mean, what is your take on how RT or other Russian media, how have they covered that? What sort of a, a narrative have they tried to present? Right. Well, I think I think that the way that the Russian media is covering even the one-year anniversary is just consistent with the way that they, they cover news in general, especially when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, I remember at the time when the plane was shot down, uh, immediately I, I, was, I was thinking, oh, I wonder, I wonder how they're going to spin this, you know, and it didn't take too long for several competing theories to come out of Russian media. Some of them being really far-fetched, um, you know, that it was the first missing Malaysian Airlines already carrying mm -hmm. dead bodies. I mean, that, that's the extreme end of conspiracy. Um, but the, the one that, that was uh, got a lot of play right away was that it was uh, targeting a plane that President Putin was flying on. And, um, and, and the one I think that they were tried to make the most plausible was that they were, uh, it was actually the Ukrainians that were responsible. So again, goes back to the strategy, blame Ukraine, always blame the Ukrainians when it comes to covering the war in Ukraine. And I mean, when you, when you would work for RT, you know, it, they do seem to kind of change their position on different issues at times. Mm -hmm. I mean, as someone who worked there, how would that happen? Would there be different guidelines or just suddenly something new would come right. down? Right. Well, uh, as, as, the, as the evidence comes out that is not favorable to the Kremlin, uh, then, then you have to change your narrative, okay? If you say mm -hmm. that uh, there's no little green men on the ground, they don't exist, they're not there, well, if news reports come out that that's not the case, we have video evidence, we have eyewitness accounts, we have, you know, whatever, documents, whatever, there, there's proof, well, then you have to shift your position and say, oh, well, they're peacekeeping forces, you know? And then it's kind of going with, uh, and you're right, it's bizarre. And it's not necessarily that they're trying to convince the audience of a particular position all the time, but simply, I think, uh, seeing it firsthand and following it, it's more of just trying to stir confusion so that people don't really know what's going on. You yeah, know? but don't you think that it's a part of the, tra uh, of the strategy? What we see with the MH17, new versions coming up. Mm -hmm. So as much information as possible, as many information as possible, mm -hmm. as many versions as possible. Don't you think that is exactly part of, of the strategy to, mm -hmm. to, to feel you know, confused and to, to, to feel that the, the situation is too complicated you know, right. to understand something? Exactly the strategy, and I think it's an effective strategy. Because, um, again, and, and you got to think, and they know the way, especially, mm -hmm. it's relevant in today's media climate because news, you know, we're on Twitter, um, I mean, you know, working in journalism and everybody's, you know, it's by the minute, by the second. Mm -hmm. But if they put out competing theories right away, it takes a while for Western journalists that, that want to find out the facts to actually come, to actually debunk it. And so they're going to put out that narrative right away and by the time that it's debunked, it's already that initial impression, and first impressions matter, and I think Russian media knows that. And so, um, and so I think that, and I'm seeing it because I've done some traveling throughout Europe, Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the Baltic states, and, and you really feel this frustration and exasperation with how do you deal yeah, with yeah, this, this is, menacing. This is exactly what, what, what the most interesting part. How, how, do, what's the influence? How does it work? And whether people do really are, uh, whether they are caught into this, you know, um, into this vicious circle of information circling around. How does it work in the United States? How, how you know, um, 
whether people are really watching, believing, and following. Right. Okay. And this is where it gets strange or kind of complicated because people ask, well, who actually believes in these crazy alternative theories that Russia puts out, that Russian media puts out? You know, they, they give a platform to 9-11 truthers, um, mm. some other far-fetched conspiracy theories. And, um, and I, I came to realize, and from my story and my experience in actually being a target of, of Russian media, the way that it does work. For example, when I had resigned, there were theories that they put out about me, about who I am, that I was a CIA agent, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, all a self-promotional stunt. And one that really stuck was that I was uh, a neocon, part of this greater conspiracy theory, a, a greater conspiracy to ignite another Cold War. And this one really stuck, and it was hmm. tweeted over and over again by RT correspondents, and this this following that they have that really uh that and they use these words, you know, if you are against the Russian narrative, you're either a neo-Nazi or a neocon. So, you they, on both ends. <laughs> so yeah. they use these kinds of words to brand you, and is it effective? Well, yes, because I'm spammed by the Russian trolls and the sympathizers that maybe aren't the paid trolls and being like, oh, you know, you, you're, you're a fraud. I mean, some expletive words that I can't say right here on, you know, on the air. <laughs> and, and, and it works and, the, and it mobilizes them. And so, you know, it becomes well, wanna, a wanna, controversy yeah. and it becomes, there's a narrative out there about even me. And I'm using this as just because I mm -hmm. feel like it's a microcosm of the way that it works mm -hmm. is that, you know, and then my Wikipedia page was all this one source. It was controlled. And it takes a while. It took a few weeks for it to correct itself. Well, which but is the same thing you're talking about, that then that first version has come out and people believe that believe even it. it's and corrected later. And then all of a later. sudden it's like, well, uh, maybe she was controlled by a neocon organization. Maybe she was, you know, maybe well, which who is, knows. Which, who which knows? is what I want to bring yeah. it knows? back to. Because, which is with Ukraine. Yeah. Who knows who's responsible? Yeah. Who knows who fired those shots? It's, it's mm -hmm. always competing, competing theories. And uh, I just want to quote you because you, sure. you said it really well. I mean, what you're talking about is uh, other people have spoken about it too, the wrecking of the information space. And I just wanted to quote part of what you had said to Congress. Um, we'll, we'll play a brief video of you, but I'll read it here. It says, the Russian bosses say that the organization is simply providing another perspective, one that is ignored in Western media. The implication there is that there is no such thing as objective truth. But let us not get duped by falsehood. Someone is responsible for pulling the trigger that killed Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov. Someone is responsible for launching the Buk missile that downed MH17, killing all 298 passengers on board. And what I found so powerful about that is if you make it all relative, mm -hmm. you lose any accountability or any any sort of real pain or yes. suffering. Yes, and uh, that's definitely a strategy that is used by Russian media. The editor-in-chief of Margarita Semenyan had said herself that there is no such thing as an objective truth. And, um, and, and I think on the surface, it sounds like a really enlightened position that, oh, you know, there's a perspective. Um, there, everything is just a matter of perspective. Uh, but it, it sounds good. It sounds really good. <laughs> you know, you have a viewpoint, you have a viewpoint, but then it gets, it gets a little strange and it gets a little funky when you put crazy people on that have no interest in the truth. And then you say that their viewpoint is just as relevant as, as somebody else that is really interested in seeking the truth. And yeah, it manipulates this idea of, of, of moral relativism and, uh, and it really, um, manipulates that and the way that Western media works, you know, we, we try, there's, there's standards in, in the newsroom, you know, mm. to try to uh, credit your sources, fact check, stuff like that. Whereas in Russian media, it's those kinds of checks and balances aren't there. So it's more enforce the narrative, enforce the narrative. How do you do that? Well, you know, we'll ignore certain things, we'll deny certain things. And then if it gets twisted enough, I mean, lie, So it takes, takes time for someone in the newsroom to understand, understand. what is happening, happening really, because you were not, uh, obviously, uh, the only one who, who is well, uh, that leads mm. us to, to, to a question, uh, maybe a little bit about HR strategy. Mm -hmm. Who is really working there? Mm -hmm. Who is who is seeking job at RT, right. and who is believing in that job? And you know, working right. principally. Right. So uh, I would say there was. It's a spectrum. Um, I worked at RT America, so the, the bureau was in Washington, D.C. So a majority, interestingly, of the employees are Amer were, mm -hmm. were American there. Um, they have, you know, other bureaus in, in London and, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. so Western journalists. And um, when it comes to reporters, the, the, you know, for the newscast, they want, 
you know, this, to have some kind of basis in truth. So that's a thing. You can make a lot of news stories, and I, I did I did a bunch that I thought were worthwhile. You can, you well, can do stories that make the West look bad and have it yes. be 100% true, because we do have our own problems. Uh, and so especially <laughs> Occupy Wall Street, I mean, from being from New York and my friends who are in New York, at the time there was a lot of positive you know, feedback, the fact that you and others, that they were giving press coverage to something that wasn't being covered elsewhere. Yes. And that cover colored a lot of people's reception of RT later on. Um, yeah, but they we're happy to see RT. I remember we covered it for quite, you know, very in depth for a long time. And when we arrived with our green microphone, they mm. were we were welcomed. <laughs> they were they were glad to see us because they knew that we were, you know, that we would cover them fairly. Um, but I mean, coming back to this, what what is the ethical issue? Because I know I don't know as much about the DC bureau. There are articles mm -hmm. written about the journalists that were sought for the Moscow bureau, often from the UK, fresh out of their degree yes. program, not speaking Russian, no experience there. Basically, people they could take advantage no, of. No. So by the time that you know they realized what was going on, they'd already had them for a while, and they could replace them with new people. But what are the ethical questions for journalists? I mean, how in a difficult market with not a lot of mm -hmm. jobs, how do people deal with that? Right. You know. Um, and I think I think they're going to have an increasingly difficult time recruiting Western journalists. I, I, I would think with a lot of the fallout that had happened as a result of the coverage of, of Ukraine and um, I guess resignations some high yeah. that have uh, <laughs> exposed it to some extent. Um, another thing that yes, that's true. And so you know, if some of the journalists are fresh and they they, they want to impress their bosses, well then you have this some instances where the journalist can be molded, you know, and if you don't ask the right, if you ask the, if you don't ask the right questions rather, well, then you're going to kind of be kind of the soft power. You're going to be, you're going to be punished. You're, you're not going to be put on stories. You're not going to, you're not going to get a raise, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to, you're going to, it's, it's, it, life is going to be difficult for you. However, if you push the line, if you don't push, you know, the, the, the wrong buttons, if you really play to that Kremlin narrative, then you're you going to advance ahead. very quickly. So if you are okay with that, it, life is going to be pretty good there. Um, so there's that kind of camp, and there's that way that it happens. So as a result, there's this strong level of self-censorship that happens. You know, in the morning meeting, just to not pitch that story and not ask that question. Otherwise, it's going to be a really long, awkward silence, and the Russian bosses are not going to be happy. And you're that much farther away from the raise right, or the trip right. or whatever it and is. Then, but and the, but mm. then uh, another th way that they um, are able to get journalists or commentators is, is actually um, actively recruiting people that come from a fringe background or a mm -hmm. conspiratorial background. So, you know, there's people that um, tend to be very uh, conspiratorial and, you know, one of the hosts that they hired was a very staunch 9-11 uh, truther and she comes from this kind of background, I don't want to implicate anybody specifically, um, that, that would kind of, that has that way of thinking that the West is corrupt, that, uh, you know, that the U.S. is, is you know, just trying to take over the world and it sounds it sounds crazy sounds like you know? an attractive idea exactly so. but there's people that believe in that and they're mm. given a platform and well, yes, disproportionately. That, that are given a platform. But to change, I mean, the, that'll be the last question for me, but an interesting one. I mean, since you've moved into this role of explaining it and trying to explain this, you know, propaganda war, whatever people want to want to call it, what has the reception been? I mean, how have people received you? And, you know, I feel like maybe I'm being a little biased, but maybe some of the people you're explaining it to are older politicians, older <laughs> executives who don't have the best grasp of internet or some of the media. Right. You know, I think when this had first happened, when when I had resigned, there wasn't really um, an understanding as to how effective and how manipulative and uh, media can can be used to, to manipulate a war in this in this situation of conflict. Um, but I'm seeing as time went on that there was increasing interest. You know, we heard one of the top leaders of NATO saying this is one of the greatest information blitzes that we've seen ever, um, and leaders, you know, in the Baltic states and elsewhere, Eastern Europe, really acknowledging the effectiveness of, of this kind of propaganda. And of course, uh, in our, in Congress, in U.S. Congress, we, we just by that, that uh, hearing mm -hmm. before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs show that there is now this interest and response and this, um, at least this feeling that we need to do something to counter it, you know, to take it seriously. So I'm seeing that as the conflict had played out, that there's political military journalists all over the world, specifically Eastern Europe, Central Europe, the surrounding regions that are 
um, affected by the conflict, uh, mm -hmm. more or less sanctions or, or uh, possibility of, of it spreading elsewhere, and of course the more muscle flexing from Russia. So you're seeing a growing interest in it and, and um, a desire to do something about it so that hopefully we can amplify the way. truth and so that these this menacing, you know, disinformation that's coming out from, from the outlets and this troll to war and it. all of this, uh, that we can fight it. Well, I think I'll have to, I have to end it there, but thank you so much for coming on and talking to us.